Uh, this this evening we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 20. Uh, last the last two classes that we've had, we've looked at the Beatitudes. There are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine Beatitudes, eight Beatitudes, really. Uh, verses 11 and 12 compile with verse 10. So you have eight different Beatitudes, eight different things that Christ says. If you're going to be my servant, you need to possess these things. You need to have these attributes. And now looking at verses uh, 13 through 16, uh, we see kind of a, a, a furtherance of these expectations, but really these are uh, what I define as the, the Christian's purpose. Uh, looking at the disciple of Christ, uh, verse thir or 3 through 12, he said this is what he looks like. And verses 13 through 16 now, he's like, this is what my disciple is. This is what my disciple is. Look at verse 13. We find our first attribute. Uh, which I, I have these up here on the board. Um, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I'm going to come back to the full screen for you. Uh, verse 13. The Christian's purpose, the first part of my purpose is to be salt. We are the salt of the earth. Now, I know that many of us uh, understand this idea. Uh, salt is a preservant, right? It's been a preservant for long, uh, for a long, long time. It's been understood to work in that way. Uh, and so as we think about the Christian and how it is that the Christian is a preservant, uh, I, I guess the way to look at it is that we are in the midst of a, a morally and spiritual decaying world. And what we're trying to do is provide a, a longevity. Not saying that um, it, it's, it's not the same as whenever Abraham was uh, trying to intercede on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's saying if, if there's 10 righteous men, if there's five righteous men, it's not like that in saying that. Well, as long as Christians are on the earth, God is going to withhold his wrath and the second coming is going to happen. That's not what we're saying at all. Uh, Paul talks about how uh, whenever Christ comes, the dead will rise and then those saints who are still living will gather in the sky. So we know that's not the case. Um, but but the idea is that, uh, you know, uh, you look at the Christian. The Christian has the essence of Christ in him. And it tells us in... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 that daily our outer man is perishing but our inward man is renewing. I'll put that down here. Uh, actually, I don't think that's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. I think that's in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is for we walk by faith and not by sight. So that was wrong. But it is 2 Corinthians 5, I believe. Uh, Doyle is going to be doing a fact check for me right quick. Um, but as the Christian, you have the essence of Christ. And so Christ is working as the preservant for us, right? It's physically, we're decaying, but spiritually, morally, we are constantly in a cycle of rejuvenation. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to supply that to the world around us. The world around us is lost in sin. They're, they're, uh, right now, they're, they're on the... Uh, the fast track to death, right? And so what we're trying to do for them is to give them life, to preserve them. No? No, I don't know. Well, the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is being renewed, renewed day renewed. by day. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay. Well, I'll find it. Yes, sir. Um, so salt is a, a preservant. Um, also, salt it is something that gives taste, right? Um, Second Corinthians four sixteen. Second Corinthians four sixteen. Off by a whole chapter and some verses. Second Corinthians chapter four verse sixteen. Uh, but salt gives taste. I mean, most of us at some point in our life have decided to do a diet, right? And part of a diet. 
uh, typically is to lower your sodium intake because the more sodium you have, the more uh, what they call water weight that you build up, which I found out doesn't actually refer to your hydration levels as other fluids and stuff. Totally confusing. But um, the more sodium you have in your body, the more water weight you hold. And so whenever you're doing a diet, you cut back your sodium, so you're cutting back your water weight. And uh, if you've ever done that, you and I can sympathize on the point that it is awful, absolutely awful to eat low sodium food. Why? Because it's tasteless. It has no flavor. It doesn't, it doesn't have that pizzazz that you need. And so um, the Christian is, is kind of like the pizzazz, you know? We're the taste of God to the world. Uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 4, Peter told them, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Quoting from Psalm 34 and verse 8. Uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we're the ones who are, who are basically the, the, the sample. Whenever you're going through the grocery store, uh, like a Sam's Club or something like that, and you have the person out there providing samples, we're that person. We're saying this is what godliness is is like this is what it looks like this is what it tastes like we are the the flavor um also if we're going to be the flavor if we're the taste of godliness what that means is that we have to be in the midst we have to be on top of uh that bland uh the bland meat in order for it to work i can't take a uh, i can't take ground beef put it over here, have my salt over here and expect for it to taste good if the salt's never been put on it. I can't do that. I can't expect for there to be any sort of change in the world, any sort of flavor in the world if the church isn't there in its midst. Uh, some people, whenever they practice Christianity, they practice uh, hermit Christianity. They want to go and be alone, go, go off to a monastery, stay there. Go, go off into a remote area of the world and stay there and preserve themselves. And they totally ignore the fact that they've been called to be the salt of the earth, to be the, the, uh, the thing that supplies the preservation and the taste to the lost. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, uh, when salt, uh, notice this from uh, verse 13 as well. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how then shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Uh, the emphasis here is that when salt becomes ineffective, um, it's useless and it must be cast off. Uh, this parallels Matthew chapter 7 and verse 19 and uh, 19 and 20. Where Jesus, he's talking about trees that bear fruit. He says a healthy tree, a good tree, this is a tree that's desired by the Lord, bears good fruit. How do we know it bears good fruit? We can see it. A, a diseased tree, it bears bad fruit. How do we know it bears bad fruit? Because we can see it. We're able to look at it and inspect it. And uh, the way that we can look at ourselves or the way that it's looked at with us, whether or not we have our saltiness, is they can look at us, the people can look at us, God can look at us, our brethren can look at us and say, they're not doing the work of the Lord. If we're not doing the work of the Lord, we have lost our saltiness. And just like it parallels Matthew 7, 19 through 20, we're cast off. He says that the disease tree is cut off and cast into the fire. It's useless. There's no point in keeping it. It, 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 it runs the risk of uh, diseasing, diseasing, is that a word? I don't know about that. It runs the risk of inflicting the rest of the trees, right? If you, let, if you leave the bad tree, the rest of your plants can uh, get the disease from it. And, and so, spread. yeah, it'll spread. And so the same thing with saltiness, you leave a batch of flavorless salt inside the midst of flavorful salt, the saltlessness spreads out uh, to the whole the whole group. Uh, when we consider salt, uh, two passages um, come to mind. You have Colossians 
chapter 4 and verse 6, where we are instructed to let our, our, our speech always be seasoned with salt, be seasoned with graciousness, uh, Paul would say in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we understand that to mean to be pleasant. Right, And so if you're looking at how we are to be the salt of the earth, uh, it, it goes a little further than being a preserver. It goes a little further than being tasteful, a little further than being useful. It also has to do with being pleasant. Am I pleasant? Um, you know, the, um, the world will never um, bow themselves down. Those who are lost will never bow themselves down, uh, at least not in, in life, in this present life. Um, so long as the church presents itself as undesirable. Uh, what I mean then is, is we're not going to be able to fulfill any evangelism if we aren't pleasant people. I mean, what what kind of what kind of what kind of effect? can we expect to have on people if, if, if our approach to things is with a, a grimace look, if we're angry all the time, if we look frustrated all the time, we're complaining all the time. That's not pleasant. That's not good to be around. No one wants to be around that. That's, that's a different kind of flavor. Yeah. So, you know, sour and you know, being that type of person, yeah. Yeah. Not desirable. Yeah, so with pleasant, not only are you supposed to give flavor, give a good flavor. Make people want it. Make people want it. Don't be sour. People like sweet. Um, also something to consider is uh, Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13 is the section that refers to the grain offering. Uh, this was an offering, of course, for sins, and it was commanded that this offering be done with salt and that all offerings be done with salt. And so salt is a necessary component to the, uh, uh, to the validity of the sacrifice, right? If I was to offer grain, and it had no salt, would it come to the Lord as a pleasing aroma? By no means. But if it has salt, then it arises as a pleasing aroma. Uh, we, we looked at uh, last Sunday in the lesson, I talked about, you know, uh, Ruth had to put on her perfume. And we talked, uh, I mentioned briefly uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Um, salt, the, the, the saltiness aspect, uh, as far as uh, being like Christ, having those attributes, being that flavor, being that pleasant flavor, it is absolutely uh, necessary whenever it comes to the validity of our sacrifice. And our sacrifice is our daily living. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. The list goes on and on and on, right? Um, let's talk here about verses 14 and 15 now. Verses 14 and 15 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. All right. So we are the Christian's purpose is to be a lot, be the light of the world. We are expected to be the light of the world. Some things about light. Uh, it's understood that light casts away darkness, right? Where there is the presence of light, there is no presence of darkness. You can put down um, Ephesians 4 and verse 11. We are to have no part with the unfruitful works of darkness, were to cast those things away. And you think about the prince of darkness himself, not Ozzy Osbourne, but Satan, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 17 says that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. If we resist the darkness as the light, it's not going to overpower us. It can't overpower us. 
it can't comprehend us. Why? Because our light, the light that is present in Christians, it ultimately goes back to this light, and that is John 8 and verse 12. John 8 and verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He is the source, the ultimate source, and as I said, the darkness can't comprehend it, can't overcome it, as John chapter 1 verses, uh, or John 1 verse 5. It cannot overcome these things. It cannot overcome Christ. Darkness can't rise above it. Uh, light, if light is going to be effective, where does it need to be? In the midst of darkness, right? If I have a flashlight and I'm walking in the dark church building hallway, is it any good if it's just not on? Does that flashlight matter at all? Does it matter if my friend is walking next to me and they're scared? And I go, hey man, don't worry, I got a flashlight. But I don't pull it out and use it? Does that matter? Absolutely not. It doesn't matter. Light is only effective if, if it is surrounded by darkness. And so as Christians, Christians are only effective if we're theoretically surrounded by darkness. And by being surrounded by darkness, the idea is that we are in the midst of of a crooked and lost generation like Paul talked about in Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 15. He, said, you, he says you are lights in the midst of this wicked and, and corrupt generation. We are shining bright. We are the example. We are the thing which points to the way. Um, Proverbs chapter 4 in verse 18 is a, uh, a verse of interest here. Proverbs 4 and verse 18. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Uh, that is Proverbs 4 and verse 18. Uh, the idea there is that we are continually growing in the essence of light, right? We're, uh, light is measured in lumens. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's measured in lumens. And so the idea is, you know, maybe one day we're 100 lumens, right? I'm a newborn Christian, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm 100, newman, 100 lumens. Now I'm an elder in the church. I've matured. I've had... Uh, I, I've had my power of discerning tested, Hebrews 5 and verse 16. And so now I'm a thousand lumens. I've grown. And the ultimate example, and this is theoretic, is Jesus, who is a million lumens. And so my aim, my goal is to continue to grow in that until I reach that, until I become brighter and brighter until the full day, right? Pushing on and on and on uh, towards, towards being like him. Um, notice uh, this about um, being light of the world, uh, being lights to the world. As I mentioned, uh, you know, from walking in the church building hallway, I have a friend next to me, he's scared. And I say, don't worry, I got a light, but I don't use that light. Um, how does he believe me that I have light? Light is not proved by word. It's proved by action. If I ever walk in the church building and it was dark and I flipped on the light switch and the lights didn't turn out, my immediate thought is the lights are broken. They're not working. And so um, the immediate thought that people can assume from you, if you're a Christian and you are not uh, being a light to the world, if you're not ministering to uh, people around you, if you're not sharing the gospel with people around you, is they're not of the light. They are not children of the light, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 5. They are not fruitful. They're not fruitful. And the expectation goes back to Matthew 7, 19 and 20, that if you are unfruitful, you will be cast away. Uh, you will be cast off. And we don't want that to happen to anyone. I don't want that to happen to me. Um, 
Something else to consider here, John chapter 5, John chapter 5, and verse 35, you have John the Baptist uh, being affirmed by Jesus to the Jews around him as a righteous man, and his righteousness is compared to a brightly burning lamp. Um, so, so light is a, uh, a clear parallel to godliness. Also, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Paul is trying to get across the point that as Christians, as godly individuals, you're not supposed to be uh, mingling with Satan's people, the, the worldly. And he brings out in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, for what fellowship does light have with darkness? And emphatic answer is uh, none. Uh, look at verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Verse 16, we are to be, the Christian's purpose is to be a testimony. We are a testimony. Um, and he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. If my light is shining, then people can see there's something about this. This is actually working. If people can, can, can notice off of me the goodness of the Lord, the taste of the Lord, then people are going to say, there's actually something to this. If people can see me doing uh, godly things, chances are they're going to know I'm of God, right? If they, uh, you ever, uh, probably not, uh, but as a, as a minister, especially like um, what I noticed in my time in Chicago <clears throat> is uh, people kind of treat you differently when you're a minister. And, and the idea is, well, he's a, he's a man of God. And, uh, you know, um, whether or not that's something you put on display, uh, it's noticed, right? I mean, people change their behavior around a minister because he is the man of God. He is the minister. He is this, that, or the other. Um, and so just as like that is noticeable amongst uh, brethren or that is noticeable amongst um, denominational folk, uh, it needs to be noticeable in, in everything that we do. That uh, if I look at the way he's behaving, I should be able to look at that and say, that is the work of the Father, and in turn give him glory. We are the testimony. It's kind of like a, like you're buying a, like you're buying a product, and uh, you go to like a product's website, and usually at the bottom, uh, if the product has its own website, there's a portion called testimonials. And what that is is that it's people affirming the fact that this product works this is the real deal this is worth your time that's what we're supposed to be doing we're supposed to be the uh we're, people are supposed to be able to look at us and, and be able to test us and, and be able to ask us questions and we prove this is the real deal this is legitimate this is something that you need to be a part of this is good for you this is good for you so Three purposes of the Christian, verses 13 through 16, to be salt, to be light, and to be a testimony. Let's look here at verses 17 through 20 at the Christ's purpose, uh, Jesus' purpose in coming. Of course, Jesus mentions that he has several purposes in coming, right? I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. I have... Um, uh, I have come to seek and save the lost. You know, you have uh, all those different reasons why Jesus said, I have come. Verses 17 through 20, we're going to find some more reasons why Jesus has come, uh, what his purpose in, in, in um, making himself known was. Let's look at verses 17 through 18 for the first one. Verses 17 through 18, he said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them for truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away not an iota not a dot King James not a jot nor a tittle 
will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Uh, so verses 17 through 18, Jesus says, my purpose was to fulfill the law and the prophets. Well, what is there to fulfill about the law? Um, Romans chapter 7 and verse 12 tells us that the law is holy. The law is holy. It is a good thing. It teaches us what sin is. However, the problem is, verse uh, Hebrews 10, verses uh, 1 through 11, paints a vivid picture of how the law cannot provide salvation. It can't do it. Um, and, and so what does provide salvation? Well, you have uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. It's not silver and gold. It's not the ways that were inherited by your forefathers, reference to the law. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Uh, Hebrews 12, or rather Hebrews 10, in verse 12 through 14, what provides salvation? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 6. 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through what? The law? No, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ offers salvation. So he came to fulfill the law. The law set up a, an example. Hebrews 10 verse 1, it is the shadow of things to come. It is showing you this, it, 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 this, is, just the, this is just a glimpse of, we, we can't wait for you to see the, the whole thing. It's kind of like with a movie, right? Why does a movie come out? Well, to fulfill the trailer. Imagine if every movie that's ever been made was just the trailer. You'd be left with a lot of questions. You'd be left wondering a, a lot of different things. There'd be so many different hypothetical endings. But a movie was made to say, this is what it was. So Hebrews 10 and verse one, here's the law, here's the shadow of all these things. And people wonder, What's the purpose of the tabernacle? What's the purpose of these feast days? What's the purpose of offering a lamb? All these different things. Well, Christ is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it's all about. So Christ come to fulfill the law, to provide salvation. The law taught you, um, the law is holy. The law provided grace. You look at uh, people in, in the, we, we see in the Old Testament people being provided grace, but it wasn't salvation. Salvation comes from the Lord. Uh, salvation is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Uh, so he came to fulfill the law, and that means providing salvation, and he also came to fulfill the prophets. Well, imagine if Isaiah just said in Isaiah 7, 14 that the, that, uh, the Messiah was going to be born of a virgin, and then no one ever comes and is born of a virgin. Would Jesus be the Messiah? No, no. Imagine if uh, Gen Genesis 3 and verse 15, God told the serpent, he told Satan uh, that there will be a seed that comes from a woman. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Now imagine if Satan's looking at it now and going, you know, there's this guy, Jesus, he's calling himself Messiah, but he hasn't beat me. He hasn't overcome me. Is that fulfillment? Of the prophets, if Jesus just says, I am those things, but I haven't done those things. Matthew chapter 1, Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, verses uh, 14 and 15, Jesus conquered the one who had the power of death, that's Satan, through death. Uh, if you really want to get into a physical crushing the head, bruising the hill, here it is. He got a nail stricken through his feet. There you go. There's a bruise of the heel. And it was provided as a part of his death. And in his death, he conquered Satan. So uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Um, so Jesus came to fulfill the law of the prophets. I, I, I think that's pretty simple. He came to give salvation, pull him free, uh, to provide grace. He put down uh, Titus 2. Verses 12 through 14. Uh, he came and provided those things and he fulfilled the prophets. Uh, he, he made sure that people knew, I am the Messiah. If he was just saying, 
uh, before Abraham was I am, and he never did anything to prove that I am, and it would have been fruitless. Um, look at verse 19 here. Verse 19, he came to emphasize, Christ's purpose is to emphasize a standard. It says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does the, uh, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19, he came to provide a standard, a standard. This is important and, and this needs to be followed. It needs to be followed to a T. Christ, Christ says, I'm here to fulfill the law. I got to follow it to a T. To, to the jot and the tittle, the, the very minimal detail. I've got to fulfill it. Uh, and, and so the standard that I'm giving you, the commandments that I give you, you got to follow them to the jot and the tittle. You got to follow them to the most minute detail uh, being included. So he comes to emphasize a standard. And uh, perhaps the tie between verses 19 and 20, uh, verse 19, you know, he says, whoever uh, is taking these commandments that I'm giving you, and he relaxes them. He says, this, it, this is a person saying, baptism, essential for salvation. Come on. It's not that serious. Uh, this is a person saying, really, no guitar or worship. You think God actually cares? These are people who relax the commandments. And uh, perhaps a tie between that and the Pharisees uh, was, was amongst the... Uh, the Pharisees were amongst the, the priests of the Jewish people. And amongst the priests were not only Pharisees, but there were Sadducees. And Sadducees believed that... Um, the, that the resurrection is kind of a hoax. There's no such thing as a resurrection. And uh, perhaps uh, that, that could be a tie between the two is, you know, you have some people, verse 19, who say it's not a big deal, right? And then you have some people, verse 20, the Pharisees, uh, who say uh, you need to follow this to a T, but you need to leave your heart out of it. Uh, verses uh, 21 and following, 21 through 49, or Christ making known that, yeah, you need to follow the law to a T. You need to follow the commandments to a T. But you got to follow them with your heart. With your heart. Not just, it's not all just about the action. We're going to see that in chapter 6 as well. So verse 19, he comes to emphasize a standard. This is my standard. Follow it to a T. Make sure it is your life. Um, Look here at verse 20. He has come to, uh, his purpose is to elaborate on righteousness. Elaborate on righteousness. Uh, verse 20, for I tell you, unless, uh, circle that word, highlight that word, do something with that word. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, underline this, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, he came to elaborate on righteousness. Verses 21 through Matthew chapter 7 and verse uh, 27 are Christ elaborating on righteousness. Matthew chapter 1 versus John chapter 21. Christ elaborating on righteousness. His whole life was the elaboration of righteousness. This is what righteousness looks like. Um, you, you think about this. Whenever Jesus spoke about the, the, uh, the rich young ruler, and he said it will be uh, easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle, and for a rich man to get to heaven, what was their question? Well, who can get to heaven? Who can do it? People want to know who can get to heaven. If I am a, if I'm a person who, who gets stained with sin, who can get to heaven? And Christ is making it known, my disciple can get to heaven. My disciple can get to heaven. 
And so verse 20, he's saying, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because they're not my disciples. They're doing their own thing. They're following their own rules. They're looking out for their own treasure. They're doing all these different things for themselves. Be my disciple. Christ made it known that his righteousness is seen in his work. I mean, Luke 2, 52, uh, I must be about my father's business. Uh, John chapter 9 and verse 6, I must work the works of him who sent me. That was Christ's righteousness. That's what righteousness is, is fulfilling the will of the father. And so uh, all through the Sermon on the Mount, all through Christ's ministry, he's going to elaborate on this. He's going to elaborate on this is how you get to heaven. It's not just going to leave you standing. It's not going to just leave you thinking, oh boy, I sure wish he would have finished the sermon. No, that's not what he's doing. He's tying it up for you. He's, he, he, he's painting right now with broad strokes, right? Verses 17 through, 17 through 20, these are broad strokes. I got to fulfill the law, okay? Verses 17 and 18, I got to follow his standard. Verse 19, verse 20, I got to be better than the scribes and Pharisees. Not by my standard, not by their standard, but by God's standard. So now verses 21 through chapter 7 and verse 27, he's going to come in and he's going to fill in the detail. We got the broad strokes. Now we're going to get the detail later.